one of the things that I have found in watching, um, the, I would say the last 10 years, let's say, is that people in this continuum, so people who started as first year associates, let's say 10 years ago, that are now young partners, their facility to utilize the technology and therefore be more productive and more efficient uh, has made a huge, difference, a huge difference in their careers and the law firm. Mm -hmm. the, the, again, I'll go back to it. If, you, if they don't have the right mentor and they're not prepared to be a protege, they're never going to have the judgmental skills that clients ultimately want in order for them to trust them to be their closest business advisor. So the question that you raised that I don't necessarily have an answer for is where is it on the continuum that you pull somebody out and you say, wait a second, you're relying too much on this technology. This is not the future for you. The future for you is being in front of clients in difficult situations and I'm going to grab you by the lapels and bring you with me so that you can have that kind of robust experience that you're talking about. I think it's in our system and probably your system, when somebody gets beyond the third year or so, they ought to be doing a lot of that kind of thing while they're still managing the technology improvements that allow them to be more productive and efficient. They're in the worst possible space, honestly, mm -hmm. because they're required by the people that are more senior to do all this other stuff, and you want to or I want to pull them up and make them more senior maybe than they're ready to, in part because they've hidden behind the technology for quite a while. And that is also part of the disconnect that's going on between law school training and law firm training, I think. Well, it's funny to me that, or interesting to me, that you picked that third year because we just had our inaugural um, fourth year associate retreat where we brought all of our fourth year associates from around the globe together for three days of training focused on some of those issues, making that transition, you know, talking to people about how you develop that judgment, the things that you can do to take ownership of your own career, but also doing things like innovation exercises and thinking, you know, talking with clients, having clients there, thinking outside the box. Because I do think that, at least for people like me, I basically tagged along with senior partners every second of every day of my career. You know, I remember somebody would call me and say, can you come to my office? I'd go to the office, we'd place a call to the client, the client wasn't there, I'd go back to my office, then I'd come back down again. And now, with things being done so much by email or shorter calls or things of that nature, there isn't that much shadowing going on the same way there was for people like me. So I think we're all working on how to, how to replicate that in some other ways. Um, but it's, you know, that whole issue of training. And I think the other issue that we all face that is both a positive and a challenge is this whole issue of mobility. So firms like yours and mine, you don't want people only talking to people in their own office. You want to bring the best teams together who are in different time zones, in different parts of the globe. People can be working together without being face to face. People can work from anywhere. And so mobility is a great thing, and it's also a great thing on our talent retention. But it, it changes the world from where a lot of what you learned was because you were just physically in the same place with people. So we're having to adapt. And you know, lawyers are not, um, by nature, always uh, you know, the easiest to adapt to change. But I think everybody is, is adjusting. Some better than others, for sure. Uh, particularly as the as the profession grays a little bit, uh, and you have baby boomers that are looking at the tail end of their careers and and what they're hoping their tail end of their careers. And you and I have talked about this before about about people working longer and how one manages um, soft landings and things that are sensitive to people's lives. So how do you do it at Morgan Lewis? 
Well, I think it's a really tough issue. I mean, ultimately, this goes back to the point you made before about activist shareholders. Yeah. A different way to say that is the, the word partnership is real to me, and I think at most of our firms, you know, these are relationships. Uh, our, our firms succeed because of the relationships among our partners, the relationships between our partners and our clients, the relationships between our partners and, and our associates, the re relationship between our professional staff and our lawyers. And so whenever you deal with any of those sensitive issues, what you're really dealing with is a very personal relationship issue. On the one hand, it's a blessing for firms like ours that we have people who are true experts and outstanding lawyers who are working far beyond the time that partners worked when I was an associate. On the other hand, as you've said before, we have to look at transitions and the longevity of the law firm and the legacy of the law firm. And so it's important, I think, as people are getting to a more senior point in their career to have a, a process and a culture where people feel the stewardship to bring somebody else along and to help transition um, the work that they've done so that it doesn't just simply exit the firm with them. And that's, that's challenging and it's highly individualized. You know, I, I decided a long time ago, but certainly being the chair has made this clear to me, there is no one size fits all for that. You know, each person is going to advance at a different stage of his or her career. Each person wants different things as they become more senior. And some people are really good at bringing other people along and transitioning them and mentoring. And it's something that's in their blood and that they're committed to. And there's other people who are more independent and autonomous. Um, and sometimes you have to really find a way to encourage people and point out to them how important that is. Uh, on the last point, I, I think that one of the struggles that all of us have, particularly as the lateral market has become as aggressive as it, as it has, is making sure that there's institutionalization of the client so that you can actually have something that, so, that is valuable for younger lawyers and younger partners to grow to the next level. And one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking, particularly on the last couple of points, was it is a real struggle to prevent siloing of internally in one's firm, no matter how long a culture you have and how great a legacy you have and so on and so forth. Because as you say, there are people that just want to be lone wolves. And that is a, uh, a long struggle that law firms have had um, because they feel that the, somehow that they're outside the norms that are important for the rest of us in order to grow the institution the way we'd like to grow the institution. One of the things that I very often say to people is that I, my agenda for the firm is the firm's agenda. There's no personal agenda for me because honestly, like you, there's no next job. And so as a result of that, I feel like I have, and senior leadership in the firm generally has, more credibility because of that in trying to resolve some of these really thorny issues. And clearly, the aging of your partnership population and the giving of opportunities or the earning of opportunities by younger partners is a critical part of maintaining the market share that you've worked so hard to retain with clients. Yeah. Because we're all looking at the same pool of clients generally. We're looking at a demand level that's low single digits. You've heard me say lots of times it's a pitched battle for market share. And so all of this is a protection of the of the economic enterprise so that you can maintain the stewardship that you'd like to maintain for all of those people, including your partners, mm -hmm. or not, but not solely your partners. And uh, for me, I think in this next generation of DLA, given the fact that DLA is only 11 years old, uh, it's going to be a critical part of how we build the culture because it will be seen 
by the partners that are in their 40s and 50s and so on and so forth as the real path and the real likely outcome as to how their careers are going to ultimately evolve. Yeah, I think the two things that I found the most effective in talking to people are that clients are, at least now, and I think this will continue because of all the factors we've talked about, in, back in a convergence mode. They don't want to go to 50 different law firms. They want to have firms where they know that people are collaborating and working together and sharing information. And they don't like dealing with law firms where they perceive that there are silos. I had a client talk to me very recently about this issue at another law firm where there was this perception that this partner here wasn't talking to or including this partner here. So, you know, from a client perspective, they want to see collaboration. And from a statistical perspective, I think there's a lot of good evidence out there now that the more collaborative your environment is, the more successful you're going to be at a law firm. And if you're like we are, where you're on a point system where everybody's sort of the boats rise, you're really incentivized to be collaborative. And so really getting that in people's DNA, I think, is important. I also think that as, as people get more and more senior, clients realize that a transition will come. And so if the law firm and if the partner isn't good about bringing someone else into the relationship and giving the client the confidence that their needs five and 10 years from now are gonna be met, even that person who has that great relationship might find that it starts to dwindle off because the client is gonna make a backup plan if the law firm doesn't make a backup plan. And I think that resonates with our partners. I think they, you know, they do realize that, but um, it's true that it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting challenge. And I think that both of us have firms that are very, very much built on collaborative cultures and a collaborative business model. And so I think that if we can extend it to that transitional period, you know, we have, we have partners who understand the value of that collaboration and hopefully that wins the day. We know, it's interesting that the way you have put it, we know, because we've run a lot of data on this, that the more offices that are involved, the more collaborative that we are across practice groups and sectors, mm -hmm. the bigger the market share by a lot. Well, and the study show that, I mean, Heidi Gardner at Harvard has a new book coming out, but I know you've heard her talk about this before. Yeah. I mean, she has the data that says the more collaborative you personally are, the, the more successful you are going to be as a partner. It just the statistics are there, more business, higher rates, all of those things. So if you expand that to a law firm as a whole, we all succeed together. And if you can build a culture where people are loyal and want to see the firm succeed, then that collaboration is, is an easy path to get there. It's also a nicer path because you actually, um, you know, it, it's nicer working in an environment where people are working together than where you're in a silo or much worse, uh, where there's competition, which would be hard for me to imagine, but I know such things exist within law firms. Really? Yeah, so I'm told. <laughs> um, but. Uh, it, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic. So, um, there are some personal questions that I've always, since you're a mother of four children and a person that's had a very successful career, are any of your children lawyers? No, but I'm holding out hope. I'm not giving up. I have, uh, two of them are not quite in college, so maybe one of them will get there. And one of them periodically, one of the older ones, periodically talks about law school. So uh, I, hope, I hope that at least one will be. And do you promote it or do you think that it's better to sort of lay back because whatever mom says, they're likely to go in the opposite direction? Well, I don't promote it actively, but I think that all of my kids know that I really genuinely love my career. They know all the people I work with. You know, when, um, when I was a young associate and I was having young children, my kids came in the weekends with me and crawled around underneath the library table and built cities and, you know, partners of mine who they've known forever have come to their weddings. And, you know, it's just, they know how much I love it. And so I think that in that way it promotes it. 
But I think there's a lot of forces out there that are discouraging people. The, the expense that you talked about, a lot of people are really afraid of that debt, understandably. I also think that in the aftermath of the 2008 period, hmm. where all of a sudden people who had gone to law school were either having jobs rescinded or delayed, you know, that's had a big impact on uh, the way people look at the law. So I'm hopeful that uh, the profession will, will sort of become uh, more attractive to people again. How about on your side, any lawyers? No. No? And I've recommended against it. Oh, I think, but, but the opposite hasn't worked then. You recommended against it and they didn't go the other way. Well, a failed they, strategy. They, they, knew, <laughs> they knew better than to go against dad's advice on I this see. issue. Yeah. I think part of it, was, part of it is that um, my experience of it, of, of a legal career, a long legal career, is that it has created an enormous life for them and they are very appreciative of it, but they've also seen the enormous stress and the, and the struggle, the internal struggle as well as the external struggle because no matter what one says about it, there's enormous personal sacrifice that goes on in order to achieve what the both of us have achieved. And I'm mindful of that, and I'm careful about saying to them, look, before you undertake something about this, because it looks really good from with 2020 hindsight, recognize the level of stress that it puts on personal relationships and your relationships with your children and so on and so forth. I say all the time that I am a much better father to my adult children than I was to my children growing up because frankly I wasn't there. Yeah. And it's a very tough, I think it's a very tough and growingly tough profession. That's not to say that it doesn't have tremendous value and it doesn't have tremendous excitement associated with it, but it's sometimes pretty hard to take that excitement and be able to do all the other things that one would like to do. I'm reminded of one situation where I was a pretty senior, pretty senior associate. I wouldn't quite say I was right on the cusp of partnership, but I was in that fourth and fifth year and my first child was born. And I was extremely concerned that I wouldn't be there when he walked, and I wasn't. I was in California. I mean, that kind of stuff stays with you mm -hmm. for a lifetime about this profession, but I do think it, as far as intellectual stimulation and ability to build long relationships over a long period of time, it's, there are very few things that, that can even come close to it. It's interesting because it is incredibly demanding, and I agree with you, and we could probably share a lot of stories. You know, I remember vacations skipped. Now you don't have to do that. You have devices you can take with you. But, you know, one of my children, one of my daughters, is involved in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. And she is on call 24-7. In fact, we used to laugh during the period of time we lived in San Francisco. When I came back and I was in New York, she would come stay with me in my hotel room, even though she lived in New York because it was a good way to visit with each other. We, we'd be competing for who was up later on the BlackBerry. I'd wake up in the morning at 5.30 and be on my device, and Samantha would be too. So. I think that we live in a world that's very demanding and a lot of jobs and a lot of professions are very demanding and all that technology that makes our jobs easier also makes us all accessible and so I think that you know for me there's a lot of jobs that uh, really require tremendous tremendous sacrifice and commitment um, and some of them don't have uh, some of the benefits of our job um, some of them do, uh, but I think that, um, you know, I'd love it if one of my children was a lawyer, but I think like almost everybody else, what I really want is for them to love what they do because the one thing I think that is absolutely essential to success, you have to really like what you do. You have to, even if you recognize the sacrifices, even if sometimes you're not having the most fun day ever, in the long run, you have to really love what you do if you're going to work as hard as we do. So, you know, my hope for all of them is that they find things that they're, they're really passionate about.
Yeah, this is this is a little bit of what I was saying to the group of partners in Madrid. The level of commitment hasn't changed. Right. Some of the tools have changed, and some of the ways that we relate have changed, but the level of commitment hasn't changed. And it's very hard to be that committed to something if you really, really don't like it. Right. And I wish that we were doing a better job, generally, of letting people like it. Mm -hmm.